with everything going on in our society today, I know that we are all struggling with various levels of differences and disappointments. What I mean is that today seems very different than yesterday. For example, this is how I felt entering March. Now, this is how I feel entering April. Recently, we received word that we we're going to be homeschooling our kids for the rest of the year. Now, when I think of homeschooling, I had this idea in my head of this. Having just two days of homeschooling, I now feel like this. Or a few weeks ago, going to the grocery store felt like this. But going to the grocery store today can feel like this. Business meetings used to feel like this. Today, business meetings feel like this. Who knew that the Brady Bunch would predict our future of how our community would function in 2020? Now, while we all struggle with different levels of differences in our day-to-day -day life, I also know that we're all battling different levels of disappointment. For me, it started out with losing sports, being a huge basketball fan. The fact that we would cancel March Madness seemed crazy, but then it extended to all sports, and then it extended to our schools, and our businesses, and even church. We're watching church together online but we can't gather. That's, that's strange, and, and for me, I'm grieving that a little bit. A lot, actually. I miss gathering with you in person, praising God together as a group, connecting in prayer. And the church isn't gone, it's just left the building because we are the church, and, and church just looks very different today. I've been a pastor for 15 years, and I've never experienced ministry like this. Everything that I know in terms of how we do ministry seems different than it was just a few weeks ago. I miss serving. I miss being out in the community. One of the main mantras of our church is to be for the community. But now even that is looking different than it used to because I feel that tension of wanting to be out and serve and at the same time being told to stay home. And so we're going to love our community right now by staying home to stop the spread of the coronavirus. And then we're going to look for additional ways to serve. But it's in that tension that I find myself. My schedule is different. Everything in my world right now has really been poured into the same pot of stew, so to speak. I like to compartmentalize things and, and have different boxes and schedules and plans for each thing. So on one side, I would have church and then my kids would have school and we would have home and they would intersect at certain times but now it seems like it's the same all the time and with three little ones at home it's you love being with the family but then you have work responsibilities but then you want to connect and and so you feel this tension and you're constantly wrestling I also as a leader of an organization feel the weight financially and just spiritually and emotionally and I'm guessing some of you watching this video right now can connect with this level of tension and feeling unsettled. So it's my hope and prayer that whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever disappointment that you're walking through right now, I want to tell you that it's okay. Let yourself feel and grieve. Many of us have lost shared experiences. I have a neighbor whose father just passed away and they're unable to hold a funeral. I've seen friends online who were scheduled to get married this spring have now had to put their wedding on hold. I feel for all our students in high school and in college who graduation now looks very different. And mile markers normally attached to finishing school like prom and finals and big school activities with our friends are all of a sudden canceled and gone. 
And so it's in the middle of this mess and really an unprecedented time that we find ourselves grieving and searching and longing to connect with one another. And so my prayer for you and for me and for all of us as a community is that while we cannot meet physically, I hope we can connect relationally by studying God's Word spiritually and leaning into the power of the Holy Spirit and leaning into what we have and focusing on our families and our close relationships and reaching out through phone or FaceTime or text or email, checking in on one another. I want you to know if you're watching this right now that you are not alone, that God is here, that we are here. And if you're struggling with a tension or a loss of some kind, I want you to know that we're in it with you. And we're going to jump into this morning's message, but first I want to pray for us. But I don't just want to use my words, I want to use God's words. And so I want to share a verse that comes from Romans chapter 15. And it reads this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let me pray this verse over us collectively and over you specifically. Whatever situation you find yourself in, let us go to God. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray for those on the front lines in our healthcare system. They are the heroes of our community serving and helping. God, I pray for those who may have already lost their job or in fear of losing their job. I pray that you would provide for their families. God, I pray for the safety of our community and our nation. I pray for wisdom and our leaders having to shift school as we know it, businesses as we know it, church as we know it, and to change so that we can try to not only survive this pandemic, but to thrive as a nation. And so God, I pray specifically for the needs of our people. God, I pray for those who are missing a celebration or a shared experience of some kind. And it's God, you, you meet us in our grief. And God, you are the God of hope, the God of joy, the God of peace, and the God of purpose. And so may you be with this time together as we study God's word. We love you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Today's message is entitled, A Tale of Two Gardens. We're going to look at two stories from two different perspectives with two very different outcomes. Now before we jump into these stories, wherever you're watching this video, if you're taking notes, I want you to write down this one thought. There is always more to the story. There is always more to the story. Here's what I mean. Whatever's happening around you is something that you face. But along with what's happening around you, there's a spiritual battle happening inside your mind. And so I don't know what's going to happen in the future of this pandemic. I can't control the outside but what I want to lean into this morning is the spiritual battle happening on the inside. And so through these two stories, we're going to see the tactics of Satan and the tools of success because there is always more to the story. Let's jump into our first story found in Genesis chapter 3. It's the oldest story in all of history. Adam and Eve were walking in the garden with God on a daily basis. But in a time when they were away from God, they encountered Satan, the serpent. Let's pick up the story from there. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Notice in this story that Satan attacked their relationship. Eve was doing all the talking, but Adam was standing right next to her in that very moment. So together they both sinned against God, and they both fell for the temptation against Satan. And so in this first garden, we see what's known as the fall of man. But in this next story, we see Jesus Christ himself undo what Satan did in the first garden, then with, in a garden known as the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, knowing that he was about to be arrested and crucified, knowing the weight of the sins of the world were on his shoulders, yet also living in his humanity, because he was fully God and fully man, knowing the weight of the situation, he went away to pray in the garden. Now this garden was at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and he took with him his close friends, the disciples. But the disciples fell asleep. So even in this moment of weakness that Jesus was praying, his friends weren't with him in that moment that they had fallen asleep. And so it's in this agony, in this stress, in the worry that might come from this situation, Jesus prays these powerful words found in Luke chapter 22, verse 41 and 42. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In seven words, seven words, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus gives us the picture for how to win the spiritual battles in our life. These words give us the tools for success to defeat the tactics of Satan and that we can live a life and persevere and succeed even in the midst of trial and even in the midst of temptation. It says that God felt the weight of the situation so much that the sweat, the tears from his brow turned to blood. Jesus would move on from this moment, get arrested, get betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, convicted by Pontius Pilate. As we walk into what is now known as Holy Week, we see that Jesus died this coming Friday and what we acknowledge as Good Friday. What exactly is good about Jesus dying on the cross? Well, it's the fact that he died for your sins and for mine. And there's a level of grieving. There's a level of pain. And not just a physical death, but a spiritual one. Then on the third day, next Sunday, Jesus rose from the grave. And in rising from the dead, he not only covered our sin, he conquered death itself to where now death no longer has its sting. Satan no longer has his grasp on your life and mine. And we experience the joy and the hope and the love that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. But all of this joy, all of this hope starts with the acknowledgement of Jesus in this prayer of not my will, but yours be done. In his humanity, in this moment, Jesus can acknowledge the pain, but yet he still obeyed the will of the Father. And so I want to both address the tactics of Satan and the serpent, but then offer the tools for success. Because it's important that when you face a spiritual battle, to know how is it that Satan's going to tempt you? then it's also important to know what are the tools that we can use to overcome these temptations and to persevere through these trials. And so let us go through 
step by step. First, the tactics of Satan, and then secondly, the tools for success. First, we see the tactics of the serpent in doubt, distortion, and distraction. When the serpent spoke to Eve and said, did God really say? Did God really say? He was instilling doubt in her mind. And this doubt puts something between you and God. Just as doubt in a relationship puts something between you and that other person. You see, Satan tempted Eve to doubt God's promises. Now, what are the doubts and the temptations that we could have? Well, you might have asked the question, how could a good God let this happen? God, if you were good, how could I lose my job? If you were good, how could people get sick? And those questions are honest. But those questions, when left unexplored, could put a division between us and God. And so if you're experiencing doubt right now in your own walk, I want to encourage you to lean into that and practice what's known in Old Testament scripture as lament. The practicing of lament in ancient Near East culture was one where you would weep, you would grieve, you would acknowledge the emotions that you were feeling and the pain that you were going through. And by being honest and humble before them, you can walk through the situation and come on the other side and decide to trust God with whatever may happen. And so when you look into the book of Psalms, for example, there are 150 chapters in Psalms. Did you know that over 50 chapters, over a third of the book, are lament psalms? These are psalms that are written where people are crying out, questioning, God, where are you? Even Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you've experienced doubt in your life, I want you to know that you're not alone. But I also want you to know that you don't have to stay there that doubt expressed is better than doubt ignored. And so Satan will use that to creep into your life, to separate you from loved ones, to separate you from your relationship with God, and cause you to fall into temptation. Now the second tactic of the serpent was distortion, where Satan really got Eve to doubt the promises of God he distorted her value. When he told Adam and Eve that if you take this bite, you can become like God, I used to think that, that itself was a lie. In other words, Satan was saying, well, he knew you couldn't become like God, but he wanted to trick you into taking the apple. After further study of this passage, I've actually found that the lie was more powerful and more subtle than you think. Here's what I mean. In Genesis chapter 1, we learned that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. That means that they were already like God. Satan promised them something that they already had. So here's the lie. Satan told Eve, you are not enough. You are not enough. You need more. You need this fruit. You need my help. If you do this, if you take these steps, you can be like God. The truth is that they were already like God. They were his children. They were his creation. They had daily relationship and walks with the God who created them. They were already like God. So the lie was you are not enough times in my life, I've questioned, am I good enough? Planting this church, there was a season after I left my previous position and we hadn't yet launched services where in my quiet time with God, 
I would walk and I would question, God, what am I doing? I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. And it was in those still moments that I realized that it's not about being worthy. It's about acknowledging that Jesus is worthy and that Jesus is enough. Satan will try to distort your value. If you have found your identity in your job, you are more than your job. If you have found your identity in your relationships, you are more than that. You are more than your money. You are more than your health. In fact, you are more than your sexual identity. At your core, at your soul, you are a child of God. You have a body, but you are a soul. And God loves you so much that he would die on a cross for you. And if somebody has ever come across to you and said, you are not good enough, you are not worthy to be loved. You are not worthy to go after something and achieve it. That is not from God. That is from the devil. Satan will come in and try to shame you and guilt you and try to get you off course and try to say, you are not enough. Here, let me help you. Let me make you enough with this drug, with this promotion, with this greedy object of lust or fake affection that you think you need, but you really don't. Let me give you something. See, God creates, but Satan counterfeits. And in this story, this is exactly what Satan's doing. First, he gets Eve to doubt the promises of God. Secondly, he gets Eve to distort her own value. Hey, if you take this, you can be like God. No, they already were like God because they were his children. And last, Satan used the tool of distraction. He understood the fact that he could not destroy God's children, but he could distract them. In the same way, Satan cannot break you of your eternal value, but he can keep you busy. Look over here. Look at this thing. Don't, don't, don't miss this. You need this. And in the first garden, Eve saw and delighted in the fruit that she couldn't have, and she desired it, and it distracted her from her original purpose. These are the tools that Satan uses to attack us on a daily basis. So when we are surrounded by a global pandemic on the outside, he's going to use three, these three tactics on the inside. He's going to try to get you to doubt the promises of God. He's going to distort your value to think that you're not good enough. And then he's going to try to distract you with things like drugs, alcohol, pornography, other things that are going to pull you away from who God has called you to be. But these are the temptations of the first garden. So when you're in a spiritual battle, it helps to know that Satan is going to try to get you to doubt God's promises. He's going to get you to try to distort your own value, tell you that you're not good enough, that you need something more. And then he's going to try to distract you with the things of the world that keep you from God. Now, we've talked about the tactics of the serpent, but now I want to share with you the tools of success. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gives us the tools to counteract the tools of Satan. The Garden of Gethsemane really undoes the Garden of Eden. Here's where we find the first tool is trust, where Satan will try to get you to doubt the promises of God. The solution to that is to trust him with all that you know. When you doubt and don't understand what is happening, you can trust whom you belong to. And you belong to God. That phrase that Jesus uttered in his prayer, the one where he said, not my will, but yours be done. It sounds very similar to the prayer that God told us to pray on a daily, regular basis found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. 
It says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. Those words are so precious to me when I'm surrounded by uncertainty. I think personally of struggles that I've had in my life. When I was searching for a job and I had four or five different job interviews fall through one way or another. I think about a time when my wife and I, after the birth of our first child, experienced back-to-back miscarriages, not knowing if we'd be able to have more children. And then upon finding out that we're pregnant with Carter, being so excited, but then having a complicated delivery to where as soon as they were born, both Carter and then Samantha, my wife, were both carted away for surgery. I felt worried, but yet in that moment, I experienced this this unexplainable peace. And it was this idea, this thought, not an audible voice, but just this truth that really spoke to me and said, trust me, they're going to be okay. That reminds me of when Jesus was talking to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 1. He just told them that he was about to leave. And he says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Now this situation could be described with this first sentence, couldn't it? With the loss of jobs, the closing of schools, this growing global pandemic. In this situation, Jesus could say, let not your hearts be troubled. Well, then what is the response? How do we let our hearts not be troubled? Here is the solution. Trust. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In that moment, Jesus was making claim that he was, in fact, God. You see, trust is the currency of relationships. Without it, it doesn't work. And your spiritual relationship with God is the same way. A lot of people have what if faith. The idea that, well, what if this happens or... What if that happens? Then I don't know. But what I challenge you to not have a what if faith, but instead have an even now faith. In the Old Testament, there is repeated stories of people who had even now faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were exiles in a foreign country. They were going to be thrown in a fire for their belief in God. They said, we know that God could deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will praise him. And then when they were thrown into the fire, those on the outside looking in saw a fourth person in the fire, a pre-incarnate Jesus, and those men were saved. Daniel, before being thrown into the lion's den, trusting that God could save him. But even if he didn't, his faith in him was enough. I want to challenge you, even if you're not healed, even if you don't experience the joy that comes, I want to challenge you to have an even now faith. We just walked through as a church The letter of 1 Peter, who repeatedly says that suffering is temporary. Trials are temporary, but God's glory, God's love and forgiveness and true eternal joy will last forever. And so if you're battling doubts, if you're battling doubts of, I don't know what's going to happen, if you're facing worry, you don't know if you're <laughs> you don't know if you're going to have a job tomorrow. I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you. But the most important thing I can give you 
is not wisdom of tomorrow, it's trust for today. Because the solution to doubt is trust. And it's not about trusting what's going to happen, it's, a trust, it's about trusting whom you belong to. So trust God to have even now faith. The second tool that we see from the Garden of Gethsemane is truth. It's truth. Before I jumped into my role as a pastor, I worked at a marketing company where we build websites for people. And you write articles, and sometimes you would display a website and articles and the look of something before you actually had the content from your client. And so you would use this text that was like a fake text called lorem ipsum. And so sometimes they'd call it just lipsum for short. If you're not familiar with this, it looks like this right here. See, it's text that looks like wording, but doesn't actually say anything. And it's common in marketing world and the journalism and the print world when you're trying to give a look of something. Even now when you pull up pages or a Microsoft Word template, most likely you're going to see lipsum on the screen. But much of what the world is trying to tell you right now is also like lipsum. It looks like words, but they're not really saying anything of value for you. See, the world does not need more information right now. We have 24-7 news where everybody, everybody and anybody can post anything they want. So it's not information, it's meaning. It's not lipsum that you're looking for, the appearance of words, but it's truth. What are words of value? Who actually has something to say to you? See, in John chapter 8, we see Jesus and he says this in verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and what? And the truth will set you free. That is what we need right now. Not a distortion of the facts. Not a lie from Satan telling us that we're not good enough. But we need the truth. And the truth can be known because the truth is a person. In the first part of John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So when you don't know what to think, Lean in on who you can trust and believe in Him. You can know truth because truth is a person. Truth is found in the Word of God and it is about God and it is Jesus Himself. And so when the world tries to distort your value, when you have negative thoughts and negative anxieties running through your mind, remind yourself about who God is and who God says you are. When Satan will try to attack with doubt and distortion, Jesus says to trust and lean on truth. Notice that Jesus prayed directly to God the Father. He leaned into the most valuable relationship that he could have. Satan tries to divide our relationships where Jesus brings us to a point of unity, which leads to the last tool of success, and that is of traction. Now, when I think of traction, I mean of like the stickiness, the thing that provides grip. So if you have shoes, for example, if you're wearing shoes or you have maybe those sticky socks that they wear at, you know, jump trampoline places, but also at home at, on slippers. It's important to have traction because it makes sure that you don't slip. One of my favorite games growing up was Mario Kart. I used to play this game and my favorite character, can you guess my favorite character? Yoshi. Yoshi was my favorite character. Now, if you're watching it in a room with other people, I want you to turn to your neighbor and I'm going to count to three and I want you to name your favorite Mario Kart character. Ready? One, 
two, three. All right, who did you pick? As long as it's not Bowser, you're okay. If, if you picked Bowser and you had all these choices, I'm a little worried about your mental stability, but that's okay. We'll let your loved ones that you shared that with take care of that. But what I love about the game Mario Kart is that you would do these races with these fun characters, but then you would have objects that you could throw at people like shells and other things. But one of the most common things used, one of the most common items, common items in the game were bananas. And the idea was that banana peels were slippery, and so when you would throw bananas out, that it would cause the car behind you to slip and spin out of control. In the game of life, Satan is constantly throwing out banana peels your way. He's constantly trying to lay out a banana trap, so to speak. I used to annoy my brother by shouting out banana trap every time I'd throw a banana during the game. And Satan would constantly try to throw out bananas and try to get you to slip try to get you to spin out of control. He says, oh, you didn't see this coming. Oh, I didn't see this coming. And so he's continually trying to get you distracted and away from your purpose. Jesus was not distracted. He would not be taken away from his mission. What was his mission? Well, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then John chapter 12, verse 23. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus knew his mission. His mission was to die for the sins of the world so that he could reconcile you and I and all of humanity, those who trust in him as Lord and Savior, to God. That he could forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and then adopt us as sons and daughters so that we could live together forever with him. Now, I don't want you to feel like that's like a cult-like scary thing, okay? What he's saying is that one day there will be no more death. There will be no more virus. There will be no more sickness. No more loss. No more rejection. No more betrayal. There will be love and acceptance and community and relationship and joy that comes from being in heaven with God forever. But we don't have to wait to heaven to experience that, that when we put our trust and our hope and our lives in Jesus, we can start to have traction now. We can start to have grip in our life. I've been going hiking more often. I know we're supposed to be socially distancing. And so I've been walking a lot outside the appropriate distance away from folks. But my shoes are getting a little older and so I've slipped a few times because I put my foot on the ground and then it's just on a rock and it's just slid out. Now thankfully it hasn't caused too big of an accident, but my fear is for you at home, spiritually speaking, I wonder how many of your spiritual shoes have no grip on them. That at any moment a banana peel thrown out like in Mario Kart or some type of distraction, some type of temptation, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's pornography, maybe it's greed, maybe it's gluttony, maybe it is just like self-harming or self-doubt or being isolated away from everybody. See, I, Satan tries to isolate. Jesus got alone with God and had solitude with God, but isolation with negative thoughts and negative issues and feelings not expressed can be difficult to deal with. And now you're focused in on something else and Satan has you distracted from what God has called you to do. See, God has given us a mission. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' mission was to go to the cross. Now our mission is to go to the world to tell them the good news of the gospel and what's known as Easter. I want to challenge you that even though we are not meeting together, I want you to invite friends, family, co-workers, neighbors to experience Easter online with you. 
in some sense, it's never been easier to invite somebody to experience Easter because they don't even have to leave their home. They can pull up their smart device. They can pull up their computer or TV and turn, tune in and turn on a church gathering experience and they can experience Easter in their home this year, maybe for the first time. And so just as Jesus was given the mission, our mission is to go to the ends of the earth to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey all that God has commanded us. And then he says at the end of the Great Commission that Jesus is with us always. That the Holy Spirit empowers those who are believers and so that we don't have to live in doubt. We can trust. We don't have to sit back and let Satan distort our value. Tell us that you are not enough and that you need something more. Instead, we can lean in and know the truth because the truth is Jesus. And we don't have to be distracted by the things of the world, but we can use this time to reflect on the priorities in our life and we can find traction in our life. We can get a grip on our life so that when we hike, when we move, when we take the journey, that we can know that God has given us a purpose and a mission worth living for because it was a mission he was worth, he thought worth dying for. As we go into Easter, I want to challenge you to ask big questions, to have conversations with your neighbors and your friends and your family members. Maybe invite them to experience an online Easter experience with you. But most importantly, are you going to connect with God? Which garden reflects your heart today? Are you like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Are you falling to temptation? Or are you like Jesus to where you can say, not my will, but yours be done? See, Pastor Erwin McManus said this for those that are searching for peace. He said, peace comes when you stop trying to control the world around you and instead take responsibility for the world within you. That's my prayer and hope today. I don't know what tomorrow brings. We might be just on the very edge of this pandemic. I just want to be honest and open with you. But while I don't know what's ahead, I do know we can win the spiritual battle inside. And we can do that because there's always more to the story. There's more to the story than just a global pandemic. I believe there is a spiritual awakening happening across the country and across the world, starting and growing inside of homes, inside of our communities, as people are forced to question their idols what they considered the most important. So much of their schedule has been flipped upside down. So much of what they thought the most important has now been taken away from them. The idea that this is a health crisis reminds us that death is inevitable. Whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now, we have to believe and know that death is a reality. But it's when you recognize that, that even in our grief and our struggles and our pain, we can say, God, not my will, but yours be done. And so I have to give up for me. I have to give up church as an idol. Meaning like I, I love talking to people. I love preaching in front of an audience. I love leading an organization. And now that's gone for me right now. So I have to think, is God enough? Is God greater than ministry? Yeah, he is. Is God greater than health? Yeah, he is. Is God greater than our routines? Yes. And he's good enough. And it's worth it. And that these battles that you're facing, you can overcome them because Jesus overcame death. 
And if Jesus can rise again from the grave, and we can be here as the church 2,000 years later, more Christians throughout the world than any point in all of history, knowing that the movement of the church is alive and well, and that Easter is happening next week, and we can know that God is on His throne, that there is always more to the story, and that if we attach our story to God's story, and we don't give in to doubt and distortion and distraction, but we lean into trust and into truth, and we find traction in our life, and our lives can be transformed. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Dear God, For those that are hurting, we want to lift them up. For those who are struggling, God, my heart breaks for them. God, if they are worried about the unknown, God, if they have anxiety about the future, God, if their work is changed, if worlds have collided, God, the one thing I do know is that you are here with us. That your spirit is present in the home watching this video. Your spirit is present all throughout the world. And so, God, I don't know what's going to happen. But I trust you, and that is enough. May we have traction in our lives. May we have grip in our mission to tell people about you. God, in our struggles and our doubts, God, we lean in. We don't have the answers, but we have you, and that's better. God, I pray for those that might not know you as Lord and Savior, that they can receive you today. Because the greatest thing you can do in this life is to prepare for the next. And that's only done when we trust you as Lord and Savior. We love you, God. Be with us now. Give us power. Give us truth. Give us trust. God, and give us traction in our lives. And God, as you said in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. And wherever you're watching right now, may we collectively say, Amen. I love you. God loves you. We're going to get through this. Let's keep fighting.